Uh, Angelica Vayon, Brigadier General and Dr. Doctor, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm so happy to be in Chulalongkorn University, the oldest and prestigious university in Thailand, especially uh, with our director, Professor Saurat Sir, the director for Center of Ethics, Science and Technology in Chulalongkorn University. The title of uh, my presentation uh, was provided by Professor Mazur, which is uh, Ethics of Traditional Healers in the Philippines. In the past, uh, yesterday and today, we heard about gene editing, uh, screening, modification, but now my presentation, uh, we go to basics. So, I would like to share with you um, the uh, practices of uh, the ETA community uh, in Maribela's Bataan. Just as a summary, um, in part, I will uh, be presenting the results of the uh, Martin Academy of Asian Pacific and AUSM research-based community extension partnership. <coughs> That's with the ETA community, an indigenous community, in the province of Bataan, particularly the Sitio Matanglao, Barangay Banawang, Bagak, Morong, and Maribeles. And we'll be examining their traditional knowledge and ethics of the indigenous traditional healing practices. <coughs> As you can see on the map, there are 11 provinces in Bataan. And um, the implication of the healing traditions of the IP as indigenous philosophy and the use of talking circles would provide a picture of the current ethics and practice of philosophy and its ongoing fight against colonization. Among the themes explored in this study include identity, agency, and representation. Finally, uh, you will see that the paper will conclude that based on the narrative statements of the eight human healers, they are indigenous philosophers and they apply ethics in their traditional healing. The message is the philosophy for all is the continuing motivation to ask questions about everything and to apply wisdom and ethics to the life we live. One need not be a doctor need not be a medical doctor or a PhD to be a, a philosopher. As a background originale, so how this study came about? As part of our MAP Extension Services program, our institution is located in Bataan, Philippines, and we had adopted indigenous groups in Bagat, Morong, and Mariveles municipalities, which are called ETA. And they are beneficiaries of our community outreach programs. We provide them livelihood um, and a lot of training projects. And this community outreach with the adopted ETA community had provided good opportunities for our MAP community particularly our students. They, de uh, they teach and they also play with the children in the community. So they together start sharing stories and most of all they exchange different kinds of food. And this experience has shown respect to the ETA community. The ETA community possesses vast wisdom of knowledge and ethics and these are shown in their medicinal and herbal plants that are grown within their community. And their healing practices and traditions possess vast wisdom, knowledge, and ethics. In sickness, the community asked for the advice from the elders who provided them instruction and ethics on what to do to treat their uh, sick um, neighbors. Then MAA became an academic partner of the American University of Seven Nations, it was still to a memorandum of uh, understanding. 
And that we learned and took part in a number of discussion about indigenous knowledge, systems, and ethics of indigenous healers, their traditional practices, and its implication to public health to enrich, to enrich our extension services program. And in August 2014, we were invited by AUSN in Arizona, USA, as a visiting professor. And I had met with and linked with uh, Pima, Maricopa, Navajo, and Apache tribes. And we have visited various museums and tribal communities. And seemingly, uh, what the, uh, this uh, tribes have experienced has indeed occurred across the globe, from Africa to Asia, South America, and beyond. And even today, many are seeking and working for peace and sustainability. So upon return to the Philippines, I have tried to uh, come up with a project proposal that would uh, benefit the Aita community in our province. So that in May 2015, um, we again was invited by um, AUSN academic partner that is Unsud in Purwakarta, Indonesia. It is the site of the Asia-Africa Summit in Bandung, Indonesia, which was visited, and that, that made us reflect on what had happened in the past. Then we partnered with the National Research Council of the Philippines, where your study is a regular member and served as secretary of uh, the division uh, for um, government policies and uh, international and educational studies. And we also partnered with the St. Francis Xavier Parish Church for a funded project in the adapted community. And this project benefited the community as uh, the livelihood project made the news, um, made the news, made use of the medicinal plants that are grown in their garden as an ingredients in cooking nutritious and delicious food or delicacies that they can prepare and sell into the neighborhood. Uh, so what I'm about to present to you is just a part of the 196 page uh, study that would describe in detail no, about this uh, MAP AUSN uh, research-based community education education and extension partnership with the ETA community in our province. So uh, my presentation would uh, deal with the ethics uh, of the uh, indigenous traditional healers in the province of Bataan. So let me present to you briefly the ETA philosophy through colonization. If you visit the Philippines, uh, you will see this, uh, eight, uh, these are usually uh, people that were displaced from their ancestral land. And um, Eta is one of the uh, people in the Philippines who resisted colonialism and ensured the preservation of their customs and character as a people. And depending on its geographical location, the Eta are named differently. If you go to some bodies, they are named as Ata. In, if you go to Balawan, they, call, they are called Batak. In the Sierra Madre, the Matad. In Mindanao, Mamawa. In Panao, Panay or Panao, Negrito. And in Northeastern Luzon, they are called Ata. Now, Philippines was uh, colonized by Spain. And the colonizer um, declare that for these Eta or indigenous people in the Philippines, they have to uh, to be safe from sins. They have to comply with the Spain philosophy and uh, theology. So Spain establishes churches and schools being managed by Spanish priests. They change Christianity as a strategy to continue indoctrination of the native people. Now, Eta people is also known as Negritos. And the European records of the Philippine history identify the Negritos, named by the Spanish friars, as the original inhabitants of the island, who crossed bridges from Asia before the Ice Ages. 
Subsequent waves of migrants of Malay origin came to the island by boat and mainly by force drove by the Negritos towards the mountains. The Negritos spread throughout the island and presented, presently belongs to various tribes, as I have men mentioned earlier, and developed their language and ethnic identity. The Eta philosophy of healing. So uh, basically, um, the principle for the Eta, the first principle of healing philosophy is sharing knowledge, following the ethical principle of beneficence. In addition to willingness to participate in sharing their views, the uh, area where the IP people live is also rich of the biodiversity that remains from the past so that there is a good knowledge of indigenous healing and tradition. In uh, conducting this study, I would say that uh, we are grateful to the lessons shared by the ETA community. And uh, again, as I said, these were gathered through sharing. It was just like talking, no? Talking, uh, sharing tears of joy, tears of sorrow, and true learning. We have the privilege of seeing most of the medicinal and herbal plants grow within their community as well as their healing practices and um, traditions. In times of sickness, the community consoles their elders on what to do in order to heal a particular illness. And until now, I'm still amazed on why a certain bark or a certain tree dried leaves and even bones of wild animals upon boiling them will make a sick person well after drinking the concoction. Uh, the chief leader is uh, named, her name is uh, Michonne C. And uh, she's aware of the various plants and uh, tr trees used. Um, actually, there is a separate study which I have identified uh, the uh, different plants and, and the name, uh, it comes in a different name and the name is sometimes really sounds funny. Like uh, dahon ng uh, kabayo, horse leaf. Um, but scientific name will be the same as found in different parts of the world. So I, I guess even in Australia, when I visited Australia, um, there are indigenous tribes there. Um, so I found out that uh, scientifically the names are the same, but uh, it looks the same, but it comes just comes in a different name. So the eight uh, healers practice their spirituality, giving thanks to the divine creator for the life, wisdom, and gift of healing that they possess. For the eight healers, their purpose in life is to help those sick people who would be needing their help to sustain them and not to acquire wealth out of it. So the, my study, it was focused on the philosophy of the Eta healers that make them continue their knowledge of healing, which is associated with various factors, cultural, economic, political, social, and spiritual. I also have noted a number or multiple forms of resistance and resiliency by the Eta healers and how they value wisdom and knowledge, which will be uh, presented later. And there are some limitations of, the, of the, uh, this presentation. As I said, this, will, this is a study represent just a small sample of data community in Barangay Banawa. And uh, supplemented through interactions with other indigenous healers in Marivelas, Moda, and Moro. So the, the, the research used roundtable discussion or talking circle and one of the methodologies of data collection in addition to, use, to the use of questionnaire, observation, literature, and online analysis is the reframing research methodology. What does it mean? It means acknowledging the existence of the IP people. It says that in studying the life of the data healers, it must be based on what they think, they believe, what they want, and view how they view the world. 
The Ata presence in the world must be respected and recognized. It is through this way that it is the Ata women leaders themselves who determine the research methodology. So, I will be presenting to you about five Ata women leaders, their healing practices and their worldviews. They are therefore the appropriate people in determining the right methodology, one that can honor their existence. The, the study used indigenous research, a research that respects the way of life of IP, their worldview, their culture, their traditions, and the knowledge that they possess. Now the results and discussion. So talking circles for philosophical dialogue. For these native people, the talking circles have both a spiritual and cultural relevance. The importance of talking circle is that it offers a place wherein every participant are free to openly share their individual stories, their life experiences in a respectful, impartial, and non-confrontational manner that are accepted among them, their group members. Space is very important for the ETA. Native people can share their emotions, they can laugh, cry, share their healing practices, and uh, they can disclose that through this uh, circle because they said they also need healing as much as they also heal others. Now, let me share with you what they have shared with me. So one of the eight women healers stated, I feel good because in here, I can talk. I can share both good and bad experiences outside my community. Like what, when they see me outside, I heard them saying insulting words on how I look different from them. In sharing this story with others, Pouring out all the emotions, then I feel good. But of course, when they shared me that, it's in Tagalog. I just translated it in English. The respondents say, said that their worldview is a source of their identity. They made it clear that their thinking or belief is just one of the ways they perceive events. They have interpretations of events and share their worldview for others to know so that they may be heard. So one healer shared, when I heal, it is both treating the physical body and spirit, emotional aspect of the person, because it is interconnected. Our body, what? Our body is connected both to that and spirit. If the spirit world was disrespected, it will bring sickness. For me, a person is healed if he was also aware and respect things that he does not see. So respect for the Eta is very, very important. Another healer explained that she heals because she wanted people to get well and for them to also learn how to treat other people to continue her work when she's already gone for the benefit of other people who may need her help. She also advises her children to be observant as what is happening at present affects the future. She knows that what is happening can change the future and therefore there is a need for her to transfer her healing practices to ensure that others will benefit from it shortly. So very generous now. How about colonization and resistance in a cholera outbreak, outbreak in the Philippines? Now, there was um, an outbreak of cholera in the Philippines from 1899 to 1903. It was the beginning of one of the most terrible epidemics of modern times, lasting until February 1904, and taking by official estimates 109,462 lives, and in Manila, 4,386. Nevertheless, despite assurances from the colonial government that Western trained doctors had the solution to this epidemic, the Filipinos continued to seek the help of indigenous helpers. Among the 
indigenous groups whose knowledge and healing practices were sought were the Aita women healers. The Aita healers are, uh, they use herbal medicine and they offer prayers to the God or they call God as Apo Dios in healing the sick. Now the campaign against indigenous philosophy continues. As cited in Shimozi's study, the Aita does not consider themselves Filipinos because of the anguish and distress that they have endured from the Filipinos. Shimozu also described the experiences of the Aita people in the hands of Filipinos demonstrate that the mal treatment persists today. So let me share with you one of the uh, local Aito, Aito women healers who narrated in the roundtable discussion her personal experience with the Filipinos. I have negative experiences with Filipinos. Most of the time, whenever I sell fruits and vegetables in the market, Filipinos will ask price. Then they will take a sample of my fruit, for example, saba, that's banana. Then after eating and having tasted, they will leave without paying, not saying even thank you. At first, I was happy, thinking that they enjoyed my products. But I get sad and angry as I felt disrespected as a person. Just one, this is just one of the example, but she said I can even say more and even worse than this experience. Now, just to summarize um, the resilience of eight women healers. The eight women healers are well respected by their people and by other communities in the province of Bataan. Their population has been recognized for the work that they have been doing. They are consulted in times of tribulation. They have been called upon to make significant decisions to their community. Their healing practices remain in existence despite the presence of Western-style health centers and public health practitioners in their community. They choose to use their healing traditions to cure their people. They share the knowledge of healing with others. They think that they can heal not because of their power, but because of the help of God. But I may have continued to adopt the modern way of life, but the Aita people continue to practice the way of life and resist the experience of the colonized. In Western organizational terms, the Aita women healers are what we call strategic elites in their world. They are the custodians of ancestral and community knowledge, language, values, and spiritual being. Now, what are the implications for indigenous philosophy and knowledge? Indigenous knowledge is a body of knowledge associated with an extended stay in a particular place. The indigenous knowledge pertains to traditional norms and social values as well as the mental structure that regulates or guides the people's way of living. Through the process of learning the old, new knowledge is discovered. This is what makes indigenous knowledge dynamic rather than static. Indigenous knowledge has its history and knowledge roots holistically integrated in a way that Western paradigms are not. For that reason, this specific and ecologically and community-based epistemic knowledge is organic, as defined by Day and Kemp. Muriel Castellano Silva and Wade says, Indigenous knowledge is a product by the members of the communities. The healing practices of Isne, Eta, and Igorat women are a body of knowledge that needs to be recognized and respected since this knowledge carries with it the, li the libraries, the procedures, and other insights communally gathered over time and by experience. Now, for the ETA, this, and I quote, this is what the ETA said, you want to take our knowledge and at the end claim that this knowledge is from you. That is most, most of the uh, thinking of the ETA, ETA community. Um, that's why uh, you really have to, uh, you know, respect them 
And once you gain their, uh, their trust, then they can share with you their narratives. Implications for indigenous philosophy and knowledge. According to Shinozu, it is no wonder, therefore, that the Edas have tremendous knowledge about medicinal plants and their prescriptions. Healing the sick for them is a combination of using medicinal plants and asking for help from the good spirits. This is the indigenous source of the Eta imperative to respect and care for nature and everything on earth, both living and non-living. History tells us that the Eta women performed healing in their community. The Eta women's healing was diverse, ranging from exercise illness such as dire spirits and stomach ailment among many others. Eta, Isneg, and Igorok have the, have, have the same way of healing the sick. They believe that the spiritual and physical beings need treatments before a person who is sick gets cured. They also think that a person gets sick because of not respecting other creations. And before the healers can perform healing, they need to consult the spirit. That is how they heal. The only time they can diagnose the cause of the illness and the reason that they have great respect for both living and non-living things. Eta healers know how to strategically fight and apply precise strategic instruments to specific combat situation as feminist activists. The Eta women healers are also excluded by default and disinformation for knowledge production. They face misrepresentation and sometimes ex exclusion in some of the academic discourse. Um, the concept of agency is also a motivation for the healers. And the, some of the themes that emerge from the talking circles are the idea that I am the light of my family and my community. Another one, I love serving my family and my community. When I do things for my family and my community, I feel good because I know those little things that I do can help them. For example, when I cook, I don't only cook for my children and my husband, but I also make sure that that include the rest of the people. Now, according to the uh, healer, one of the healer, um, I heal because I want to improve the health of my people. So. There will be a health center in our, this is one of the story. There was a, there is a health center in the community. And the, but she said that even if there is a health center, there are still many people who come to her because the people believe in her healing power. I've been healing very many people who have been beaten by snakes, among other things. Some of them were about to die, but when they come to me, through my knowledge of healing and the help of my creator, I was able to help them. And she said that sometimes when she healed, they, they, uh, they, she feels weak. But she still performed healing because if, uh, he refused, if she refused to heal, the people who are in need of help may die or may feel worse. My work as a healer is the one that gives me strength and happiness. I believe that I possess the knowledge that can help the people who are in need. It is a power not only to change the life of the people, but also the life of other people. I do not ask for money or any material things. I only ask for the people who come to me. And she helps. Okay. Another um, ancestral knowledge is essential. According to one healer, my ancestors taught me how to honor other human beings. As an art healer stated, other things of us as stupid and primitive. We do not belong to any religion. All people like me did not go to school that was established by colonized people. Our children go to school, but it has bad effects on them. For instance, our children do not want to be called Eta because of the negative connotation. 
But we are ETA and we have a wonderful culture. We have been here for a long time. We have our history. However, I guess that, call, that they call us barbaric because we do not conform to the rules or to the ways of knowing of the colonized. Indigenous cultures in many cases are highly developed and were uh, virtually ignored by the colonial educational administrator. The critic includes an implicit critic of the underpinning philosophy and explicit philosophy of knowledge taught in the system. Now, what are the way forward? So what I just presented is just part, no? Only the surface of study that chronicles the culture richness of the Eight of Women traditional healers and their ethics. The Eight of Women talk about different ways of looking at identity. That it is not about just looking at the physical body, but also looking at all aspects of a human being. They discuss the methods of bringing about proactive change in their community. Even though they are not Western trade healers, the Eto community have been continuously engaged in a range of medical, political, and educational practices to sustain and grow their community. So, the actual narratives which I've shared with you can be categorized into three items. Identity, agency, and representation. When we talk about identity, these Eto women healers share their names, their age, and how they had accept, uh, acquired their legal knowledge. They discuss uh, racial identity and their race as a form of empowerment. They show different ways of looking of oppression from race, class, gender, culture, and spirituality. They also share information about their methods of understanding healing and they explain how it became their identity. They also talk about gender as an identity and how this become a form of their agency. They describe their worldview and how their worldview can be considered as their identity. On agency, the agency for the Eight of Women Healers is about making a change in their community which has been impacted through colonization. For them, colonization is the greatest challenge that they have faced in their lives because it continues to bring fragmentation into their lives and the community. However, they also believe that through the knowledge, through their wisdom, through the strength and spirituality that they possess, they have been able to resist colonization. In my presentation, we can therefore argue that in the life of these eight of women healers and in their statements, that the eight as traditional healers are indigenous philosophers with ethics. They may not have a doctorate or even higher education, but that is not a qualification to be a philosopher. The message is very clear. The message is that the philosophy for all is the continuing motivation to ask questions about everything and to apply wisdom and ethics to the life we live. So uh, that's, uh, that ends my presentation regarding the ethics of the traditional healers in the province of Bataan. Thank you very much. And I will appreciate any question from the audience. Thank you. Thank you, Angelica. Uh, any questions? No, Professor. Yes, um, please, Ryan, go to the mic. Thank you. Good afternoon, and thank you for the presentation. I would like to be clarified with regard to your definition of traditional your definition of indigenous and how do you situate uh, this indigenous uh, ethics or philosophy or way of life vis-a-vis -vis the present context of our understanding as to what uh, knowledge is or epistemology is because I think it is very important so that this becomes something that is clearly ethical more than an anthropological uh, research. Yeah. Yeah. 
because uh, yeah, that is her uh, actually that's his expertise. No, um, when you when you talk about uh, um, uh, indigenous people, these are the uh, the um, practices practices of the uh, uh, the natives what they have uh, um, uh, practice or their belief in their uh, in their uh, customs and traditions. So your question, your question is, yeah. I may restate it again. Definition. My definition of a tradition and indigenous. indigenous. Okay. So, um, when we talk about, in what sense, in, in terms of healing or in terms of uh, the people. I just like to explain because if we consider, for instance, uh, millennia, everybody is like indigenous to, to any way of life. Okay? If we consider culture, like the Philippines was colonized, and so therefore uh, those natives who have not been colonized in any way, if we call them indigenous, we, we call them natives. And so, and when we talk of tradition, you also have, for instance, in hermeneutics, uh, Western tradition, uh, you have uh, ASEAN tradition, or context or understanding so uh, I'd like to be clarified what is the uh, like uh, sphere in terms of your definition of this tradition it's like 2,000 years or mm -hmm. 2 million years or 100 million years or 2 billion years because it's, it's important as, as, as regard to how we might uh, like draw this so the epistemic value of this because otherwise because it's, it's a synod, uh, so it doesn't become exact right? it's, it's more of a perception the perception is not reality so because they are native so they believe their knowledge practices but doesn't mean that because they practice that uh, that there's, there's value to it at the same time we also have to realize that since they have survived for thousands of years without having been as you said uh, any like traditional education, for example, so there, there must be some wisdom to, to these practices. So that's why it must be made clear. How, how do you define uh, tradition in this sense? It looks like a traditional and indigenous. Looks like a synonymous, no? But uh, you're right. A traditional that is uh, the practices, practices of the people, what they are already accustomed to. Uh, the way of life uh, based on what uh, their ancestors have uh, taught them and that becomes their tradition and their customs. Now, uh, the indigenous people, um, these are the native native people who, you are right, if you are talking about a billion of years ago and the present today, they could be indigenous but they are no longer practicing the traditional, uh, you know, traditional way of uh, doing things. Um, like uh, in, 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 in Bataan, um, uh, we have the, uh, the real, um, they are indigenous, but because of the uh, um, mixed marriage um, and uh, also because of the improvement of, uh, um, improvement of race, I, I should say, um, th their looks become uh, different. No? So uh, in this particular, if you're talking about this uh, study, I'm talking about the tradition, the, the, wave, the wave of life, their uh, customs and tradition. Uh, but um, the, the indigenous, these are the native, the native people. The native people because uh, they have, the, uh, they, uh, they are part of the group. You can see how they look and uh, even their names. And even, uh, uh, but in this presentation, I'm talking about the tradition. Um, yeah. Yes, Sakala. Thank you. Thank you for a really fascinating uh, dialogue and um, for your work on this project. Please excuse me as we're throwing around numbers. Um, I will just offer that. Humanity as we know it, uh, the oldest Aboriginal people, approximately 60,000 years old. So our millions and our billions are dealing with other types of species and other types of life. The Earth itself, as we know it, is approximately four and a half billion years old. That's our solar system. But um, most of that time it was covered in water and only uh, species existed 
in the oceans, it was only about um, a quarter of that time that we got land masses and uh, birds and amphibians and about a ten, pardon me, at 10 o'clock in the life cycle of the Earth is when we started to get the kinds of species, that, the birds and the species that we know of. So humanity is relatively recent. If we look at the Earth in terms of a clock, the whole life of the Earth, three seconds ago in Earth time, which is approximately 60,000 years only, we got human beings. And we think we are in that story of the Earth, but it's much more complicated. So I just wanted to share that. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much for sharing that. Any other comments or questions? OK, well, uh, I think thank you also for photos of the indigenous people on the last slide. Uh, yes, Daniel, please. Go ahead. Stand up, please, and use the mic. Yeah. Actually, it's follow the first question because traditional medicine and indigenous medicine, this is alternative forms of medicine. And the question is whether you consider them as alternative in the sense of old, outdated, or alternative in the sense of containing important insights and concepts which should be included in a broader future conception of medicine, medicine or health. Um, in this particular uh, presentation, um, I'm uh, concentrated or more focused on the ethics, how they perceive, you know, how, um, the, the thoughts, the, the insights of the healers, but not, uh, not the medicinal uh, plants per se. But uh, I have a separate study on that. Um, I have identified 20, actually 20 plants. Um, because when I visited the, the, uh, the community, it was uh, just uh, a visit uh, trying to uh, um, apply what I have learned from AUSN because I, as I have shared, uh, I, gave, I provided you a background originally on what made me uh, do this study. Um, so uh, in the U.S., I visited uh, Navajo, Apache, and then I said, oh, and also even in Australia, not the Aboriginal group, but I have not visited my the IPs in my community. So you have to return back, no? Uh, so I said that uh, probably I can do something also for my community. So uh, what I did as part of our extension services program, um, I uh, came up with a project proposal funded by the National Research Council of the Philippines. So um, I, we visited, I think I visited the, uh, this uh, IP community that was visited by my students. Uh, they were the ones who introduced me to that community. And um, my expertise is not really this one, but I uh, gave I uh, I gave the you know the trust and confidence of the IP community because it's very difficult really to enter their community. But because uh, they um, they uh, saw my sincerity, um, and I uh, we provide you know, we gave them food, we teach them how to to cook, and even uh, brought some books. So there are a lot more. We gain the respect of the community, and even I, I really appreciate them as a people, because uh, that's why I said you don't need to have a doctorate degree, because it, it, I, that's why the reason why I narrated all this. These are the ethics. Now they have not gone to school. Some of them not. However, you can see they have a good heart. They heal not for money. That's number one. They heal even if they experience colonialism. They did not shout at the people or, you know, they don't, the, the, the unkindness that they have experienced. They did not. They just, uh, you know, reflect on it. What they have experienced, bad things, they teach their children good things. Not to, uh, uh, whatever bad things, no. They teach their children. So that is what I've learned. So, uh, so I said that you don't need to be a philosopher. They are actually philosophers in a good way. But 
that's why I um, I shared the narration and analyze what is hidden behind those narrations. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I would just say that uh, the alternative medicine is uh, Western medicine for most people in the world. So uh, don't use a colonial stereotype of what's alternative. Yeah. So, so Western is alternative. Mainstream is ITER healing. That's the mainstream. I realize because, uh, because alternative medicine is processed, right? That makes no, it's it, uh, just a, westernized? It's just the alternative is uh, saying that something is not mainstream. But for most people in the world, traditional is mainstream. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, traditional because it's really fresh from the garden. And then they bold it and then uh, yeah. they have... Thank you very much, Angelica. Thank you.